where will you find resilience? Redeploy. Okay, now I'm ready. Okay. <laughs> what I was just saying is that I thought it was really cool that Ronnie was talking about um, teamwork and diving, because that's what I'm going to talk about. Not diving, but I am going to talk about teamwork. Um, I also really love that Adrian brought up the word intuition for the first time today. Ronnie also brought up the word intuition. So my talk kind of really like takes the next step. I, think I really like that. Uh, the practice of practice is something that I'll get to defining in just a minute. Let me introduce myself. My name is Matt. I studied music. Um, I have two degrees in music, undergrad and graduate degree. I studied opera singing. So this kind of an arena is very familiar to me, actually. Uh, here's a bunch of other stuff that I did. Um, you know, I come from a more traditional operations background. Let me just put it that way. A lot of um, hardware, data centers, uh, building hardware, selling hardware, and um, really a lot of the stuff that you see there, moving into SRE and infrastructure engineering. So what are we going to talk about? We're going to talk about all this stuff. This looks like a lot of stuff, and it is a lot of stuff. Uh, the topic of resilience is a gigantic one. Uh, it's 3,500 years old. So I'm not going to be able to cover 3,500 years of resilience, but I am going to try to get there. And one thing that's kind of cool about the talks that we've had today so far is that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take what Dr. Cook said, what Adrian said, what Ronnie said, and I'm going to show you that thing in practice. But first, who in here is a musician? Lots of hands. Okay, musicians that are in bands. Little less number of hands. And if you're in a band as a musician, or even if you've ever been in a band, and I mean marching band, anything, any of those bands use improvisation? Couple, couple. Okay, about the same number of people that are in bands. All right, so that's what I'm going to talk about first. What is improvisation? So. You might hear some people say, oh, improvisation is do whatever you want. Uh, that's not exactly true. It is in some circumstances. But uh, this is just the, diction the dictionary uh, definition. Um, it's an activity, making or doing something that wasn't planned. Now, there's a few composers that uh, this is the first type of improvisation, really the first type of chance that I want to talk about. And there are composers that use improvisation and chance to build their pieces. Oh, the sound won't work. That's OK. Talk to me later, and I'll play you some cool stuff. But I've got some sound clips. Uh, I was going to play a piece by, uh-oh. Okay, so there are certain composers that um, use improvisation to build scores. I'm going to try for just a minute here to get this back online. I apologize for this. Uh, the funny thing about uh, the chaos engineering is that it works in dev too. I'm about to do that. Changing success criteria, <laughs> yeah. Um, so uh, let's see, what else can we go over? What other details can we go over? Um, sit, what? Have him, yes. Are you gonna? Are you gonna sing? You can sing. Sing, sing the presentation. <laughs> you said actually, I'm curious. Uh, you said you have two degrees in music. Yes. What What are they? Oh, okay. Um, my undergrad. So undergrad, I studied voice. Uh, and I studied computer music and composition in undergrad. In graduate school is where I studied opera performance. So one thing I actually was going to say at the beginning, and I'll say now, is that it's, it's really interesting to see Ronnie talk about the team, the diving team, getting used to that, what she called the postmortem, which was actually just kind of the, the, the team review at the end of the dive or whatever. Um, 
And you know, in music and in theater, we do that too. Um, I had to record my voice lessons. So I had a tape recorder sitting on the piano in my voice lesson, and I was required to record it. And I was requ required to listen to it. Yeah, no Jira tickets came out of that recording of my voice lesson. But um, football players do this too, right? So we get uh, sports. We'll record games, and the games get looked at afterwards. Now, I'm not a sports person at all. I don't know if they even use Jira. But I would expect that they don't create a whole bunch of tickets when they're done with that. I wonder if software, I wonder if we're just getting into this practice. I wonder if we're just starting to get used to the, to the idea that we need to retrospect, that we need to actually get together and talk about things, not having to worry about, well, someone's going to get blamed, or, oh, I'm going to have to drop all my current work because I'm going to have to do a ticket. You know, I wonder if, if we removed all that, if we would be able to get a lot of good, um, a lot of good stuff out of this kind of meeting. So there's an okay, I'm going to keep going. Yep. All right, so, okay, we're going back to the beginning. Us, improvisation ensembles, and improvisers. So here we go. Uh, what we have here, we have a collection of improvisers, um, and uh, I'm going to try to to at least drag the window over some. Yes. Is the whole window showing now? Yes. Cool. And you get to see my beautiful background now, too. OK, so I'm going to tell you about a couple of these composers real quick. I was about to tell you about John Cage. Um, the thing that distinguishes these composers in terms of improvisation is that they use improvisation to build the score. Improvisation isn't the technique of performing the work. It's the way that the score is built. Now, we have a few people on this slide here. Uh, Stockhausen is up there. He was known to do intuitive pieces, is what he called them. Uh, John Cage used indeterminacy and chance to build his scores. And the people performing them used indeterminacy and chance to make decisions about the scores. Anea Lockwood is there in the middle, destroying a piano of some kind. And John Zorn is down here in the corner holding up a piece of yellow paper. He's playing a piece called Cobra. And on that piece of yellow paper are instructions for the players. And the score of the piece is the conductor, John Zorn, holding up different instructions to the players. So that isn't improvised, but what the players do is. So it's stuff like play in a different style than the person next to you, or stop playing or start playing, and another person has a card that says start playing. So it's that kind of thing. A second definition of improvisation uh, is adaptation in a constantly changing environment. So we're getting a little bit closer now to what we know in software systems and complexity. So I like to talk about non-idiomatic improvisation as a second kind of improvisation. Uh, up here, we have uh, Yacht Blanc doing the weird thing with his face. He does these crazy vocal improvs where he does neat sounds with everything. We've got the feminist improvising group next to him. They were like, you know, there's not enough women doing free improv. This is in the late 70s. Ornette Coleman is the grandfather of free improv. I've used that term twice now. That's what non-idiomatic improvisation is usually called. Free improv, free jazz. Ornette Coleman is, is free jazz. Derek Bailey down here, who I'm going to talk about a lot more, is a free, was a free improviser and studied a lot in the discipline. You may recognize Lori Anderson in the middle. You may not know that she is a regular free improviser with musicians. Uh, Mertzbo, noise free improviser right below her. And Ikue Mori next to her is uh, a laptop musician, she uses pedals and things like that. Really, really cool. So the definition of improvisation that means the most to me and that means the most to me for this topic is that it's the development of group intuition. You probably recognize a lot more people on this slide. Idiomatic improvisation is stylistic improvisation. It's just like it's the same thing. So the cool thing about idiomatic improvisation is that people learn to do it. Now, that doesn't mean that people don't learn to do things like chants, aleatoric music, chants music, or free improv music. 
But when you talk about idiomatic improvisation, the study is very specific to styles. So you have people like Derek Carter, he's a house DJ. So he'll bring four records of crate, or four crates of records to a party, not plan the set. Just pull records out whenever, whatever he wants as he feels it. He does this a lot this way with another DJ named Mark Farina. Ella Fitzgerald, she's the goddess mother, is that a word, a goddess mother? It is now, of scat, jazz vocal improvisation. Clara Schumann, not a well-known composer, but she is well known as a virtuosic pianist in the Romantic era. She is known to have improvised all the time. Mozart, next to her, was known to have improvised an entire piano concerto in performance. He had the orchestra parts written up, but he just came in and played along with them without a score. Some other people up here, some bluegrass and country people like Bela Fleck and Alison Krauss. Now, again, they're not pure country and bluegrass people. They're working in different types of styles, but they're very, very specific styles. Bela Fleck puts a lot of like pop and jazz and rock into his bluegrass. Missy E, really, really well known, but you may not know or you may not even realize how much of her stuff that she does that is improvised. And that's true for a lot of rap artists. Ravi Shankar is right here too. Actually, Derek Bailey, on the last slide, he wrote this book called Improvisation. And this book is a bunch of um, interviews and thoughts on what improvisational music is. And he goes through different styles. This term, idiomatic improvisation, is Derek Bailey's term. We have John Zorn again here at the other corner. This time he's playing with a band named Masada. And Masada is much like the kind of music that Ornette Coleman came up with in the 70s, but with a Jewish twist. So the scales and the patterns and the rhythms that they play, even though they play a lot of bebop style jazz, they play it with Jewish sounding scales. So it's very, very particular and very, very interesting. What's neat about the idiomatic improvisers is that they spend a lot of time building mental maps of their styles. Now there's another type of team, a technology team, that does a lot of the same things. We're all on technology teams here. We're probably on different kinds of teams. We may be sysadmins, we may be network people, we may be UX people, whatever, designers, software engineers, operations. But whatever we are, we are a socio-technical system. We are humans designing software, we're building it, we're operating it, and we're using it, and we have users using it. This is a socio-technical system. Socio-technical. Makes sense, right? So socio-technical systems are all these things. So you've got incident response, SRE, knock, on call. These are uh, actually some pictures of me and a fellow network engineer, SRE, and then a knock that we work with actually in Krakow, Poland. Oh, no, actually this team is in Zielonogora, Poland. Working very hard, as you can tell. But uh, our job as remote employees, distributed team, is to work together is to build a basic compact together. And we have to think about all these different kinds of things. These are very, very similar things. You've got people in a technology team who have different mental models of the system. They may be things like what tools are being used, what the code base is, is data, you know, what kind of language is even used? What is the parlance of what they're doing? You know, a team of SREs is gonna have a different parlance than a team of software engineers. That is the same for a group of jazz improvisers as opposed to a trio of experimental vocal improvisers. Different types of things, different types of styles, different types of mental models. So how do we get together in a team and how do we reach our goals? How do we, as an improvising group or as a technology team, how do we meld all that stuff together? So 
Basic compact, I already mentioned. That's kind of the knowledge that you bring into a something. It's, it's kind of the scales. And you study scales in jazz improv. You study rhythms and you, you listen and you study chord progressions. It's one of the big things. You study modes. That's all the kinds of stuff that's like the basic compact when you come into a team. Uh, teams are the same way. You kind of have a basic compact. You have like a, a level of competence that everybody is at. That can change, but it is your basic compact. And now when we're doing something, whether it's a big long thing or whether it's an incident, or whether it's, you know, we're getting ready for a big performance or whether it's the performance itself, um, we take note of what has transpired. We also take note of the changes that have happened up to that point. You can kind of see, I don't know if you can see so much, there's a Yahtzee game in the background of this image. And the reason that I use the Yahtzee game here is not because Yahtzee is particularly intuitive to play. It kind of is. It's been a few times where we love playing Yahtzee, by the way. We'll take it over to, to uh, our friends' houses and barbecues and stuff like that. And there will always be like one or two people that played Yahtzee 30 years ago or they don't really know how to play. And they're like, uh, it looks intimidating. It's a big scorecard that you keep track of while you're playing, okay? You know what's happened. You know how much more you have to go. But the cool thing about it is, is that usually it never fails. The person who has never played Yahtzee starts playing it, and then all of a sudden, like just a couple minutes in, they go, oh, it's poker. And it's like, you don't have to teach them anymore. And that is a cool part of that intuitive like, oh yeah, know how to play Yahtzee. No, it gets a little bit more complicated. It's like open hand poker, really. So that brings me to this subject. And I'm starting from here because it's good to talk about common ground at the same time it's good to talk about how common ground fails. And this has as its source uh, two documents. Um, one you are probably familiar with, which is the pretty famous paper, Common Ground and Coordination in Joint Activity, which, uh, wow, is getting pretty old now, actually. Um, but even older than that is the book upon which it is inspired, which is Herbert Clark's Using Language. In the book, Clark goes into this really cool um, well, analysis is the perfect word for it, of a transaction at a store. It's the transaction between the woman behind the desk selling something and the person, we presume it is him, we don't know, uh, on the other side actually buying something. And I won't go into all kinds of details, but that's a joint activity. It has an entrance he walks up to the counter, he is ready to make his purchase. It has stuff in the middle, stuff that happens, all kinds of joint activities happening in there. You know, oh, I wanna buy something else. Oh, here's how much money I have. And then the woman behind the counter, oh, okay, thanks, I'm gonna grab that, here's your change. Really, really small activity, but it's emblematic for him in the book to describe the joint activity. There are other kinds of joint activities. Uh, John Ospaugh uh, uses this example in a talk of his, which is the relay racer. Uh, that's another kind of a lot, of, a lot of basic compact, a lot of common ground going on there. You don't just run up behind the next person and then describe what you're going to do. You've already built this common ground and you already have this basic compact that you're going to come up behind the next person and just yell baton. That person knows what that means because you've practiced it together. I already talked about jazz, idiomatic improvisational music. Uh, but the next thing I want to talk about, uh, after we talk a little bit about time, is a chaos engineering game day. So time matters. All of this is, you know, time. When we had the problem with the AV stuff, the conference didn't stop. <laughs> the conference didn't go, okay, time to stop. Now we all did kind of stop. But we did make an effort to adapt and keep your interest. Paul said some stuff. I, 
you know, subjected the story to you. Um, we talked a little bit more, went back and forth. So we tried to adapt to fill that problem that time ignores. So fundamental common ground breakdown has to do with, with time, basically. Now, uh, I have two examples of fundamental common ground breakdown here to make it a little bit um, easier to understand. And really, the whole reason why I think about these things in terms of music is to try to get other people to think about these things in terms of music, because everybody knows music. Even if you didn't raise your hand before, and you're not a musician, and you've never played in a music ensemble, you did not play recorder in the fourth grade, it doesn't matter, I bet you listen to music. You love music. Music and humans go together. Okay, so let's get to my fundamental common ground breakdown in music. Let's pretend I'm a guitarist in a band. It can be a small band, big band, whatever. And we're playing, we may be in the middle of a concert, and a string breaks. This happens all the time. Now, okay, string's broken. All right, I know we're about to play another tune, so I'm going to get my string out, I'm going to start burning my string. And while I'm doing that, the band leader, or whoever it is, decides, for whatever reason, oh, we're going to play the middle of the song in a different key. I don't hear that person say that because I'm paying attention to the broken string, because I'm the only guitarist in the band, I have to fix my string so we can play. So the band leader sees me fixing my string, but I don't hear the band leader say, we're gonna change the key in the middle of the song. So that represents a piece of knowledge that the band leader has that I do not have. Now, we both have the piece of knowledge that I broke a string. We both have the piece of knowledge that I need to fix the string. But I don't have the piece of knowledge that the key's going to change. So I just keep playing. And, you know, it sounds fine. Um, the string, I keep having to, you know, retune the string. Okay, we're moving right along. We're kind of in the groove. Okay, I'm going to refinger some things. Pretty cool. All right, cool. We get to the next part, and it just sounds out of tune. It's horrible. Now, that's a coordination surprise. That may, you know, if you're in the audience and you see a band do this, you're going to be like, oh, <laughs> they screwed up. But when we're talking about joint activity, that, that's exactly what this is. It's a coordination surprise. Now, when coordination surprises happen, time doesn't stop. Software. This is an event that actually happened. I can't say that the guitar thing happened to me, but this thing did happen to me, and... I happened to have food poisoning at the time. Yeah. So, socio-technical system, remember that word. There are humans in this system. Humans that are having a hard time not being in the bathroom while trying to be on call at the same time. So, system goes down. Now, I had learned to bring machines back up in the system a certain way when I was onboarded. Now, it, there never came an, an event or an opportunity for me to learn to do it any other way. So uh, when this event happened, I started bringing the machines back up. Um, the engineer who built the system sees me say something in Slack, using the standard procedure, bring the machines back up. So that engineer and me hold that information together. But what I don't know, that the information that that engineer holds, is that there's a push button way to do this. There is literally a push button, put everything back online, that I did not know about. But we had an incident. OK, so I'm going to keep going. I'm going to keep doing this thing. I'm going to keep, oh my gosh, what did I do to the database? The database is uh, it's going slow. I'm going to have to do something else. Meanwhile, engineer, who thinks that I know about the push button deploy, thinks that something way, way, way worse is happening. because. If I had used the push button deploy, the database wouldn't be doing what it's doing right now. What is wrong? So all of a sudden, the engineer is like, dude, what happened? Didn't you use the push button deploy? And I go, uh, I didn't know about a push button deploy. Well, the events, incidents, are not the right place to not know about something. Coordination surprise. So now we have coordination overhead that we have to deal with. Time doesn't stop. Stuff is still down. So how do we get around this? How do we fix it? 
so that those kinds of things don't happen. Um, you know, musicians do this by practicing. They get together and they practice. Uh, I, like, I like the notion that, especially with improvising music teams, that they, um, they don't think about a performance. They think about, oh, we're just gonna get together and play. Now, they may be getting together and playing in a rehearsal room. Maybe they went over to someone's house that night. Maybe they went to a Monday night open night or open mic at some small place. And then, oh, it's Carnegie Hall, whatever. It's just another time that we're playing. It's just another time that we're practicing. It's just another time that we're getting more information about our complex system. So there's a famous quote by Miles Davis. There are no wrong notes in jazz, only notes in the wrong places. I thought of this quote after I heard uh, Bob Edwards say this. And Bob Edwards, uh, human organizational performance, human and organizational performance coach, um, learning teams, um, and he talks about bringing learning teams into big factories that have incidents. And they get together, and they don't get together to place blame or do post-mortem or figure out what happened. They get together to learn about the system. And they get together to learn about how do you do your work? How is this system successful all the time? Dr. Cook says this too. It's amazing that any system works. So Derek Bailey calls this the practice of practice. It is a practice of practicing. It is the practice of having the practice. Improvisational music is not what it is until it is. A complex system is the same way. So, without further ado, the live demo I so promised. The way that I know it's going to work is because it's not on the laptop. <laughs> Sorry. I, I know that's cheating. But anyone know the um, Kinevin chart? I will, I, I pronounced it right. I can't believe I pronounced that right. The Kinevin chart is a way to describe complexity. It's pretty good. Some people like it, some people don't like it. I don't particularly like it. <laughs> I, like, uh, I like this, so I also don't like the word simplicity. So I'm not gonna call this simple. This is a cube of copper. So I like to call it elemental. Cubes of copper, copper is an element. It's something that we've known about for hundreds and hundreds of years. It's something that we know uh, what it's made of. Even the shape, the cube, it's a regular cube. I think everyone in this room is familiar with the shape of a regular cube. So think about that. Elemental, not simple, but readily understood. Completely understood, maybe by everyone in the room. I'm gonna put it right here. Okay, so complicated. Rubik's Cube. Why is a Rubik's Cube complicated? Rubik's Cube, and by the way, this is a Rubik's Revenge, is a four by four cube, not a traditional Rubik's Cube, which are three by three. But they were invented around the same time, within the, within the span of, of like five or six years. Now, the Rubik's Cube, or the Rubik's Revenge, as you can see, has all these different pieces. And if you know what these puzzles are about, the solution is pretty much one solution. All the sides are solid colors. Now, if I take one piece out of this, you can't solve it. If I were to take a marker and like color one of these squares in, you can't solve it. If I took a piece out and put it back in, the four by four cubes don't have a middle. See, I can turn right through the middle if I put one of these cubes back in the wrong direction, you can't solve it. It seems complicated, it is complicated, but it's not complex. It's actually very simple. I think, personally, that complicated systems are simple systems. Complicated. This is my favorite one, 
complex. Obviously, it's my favorite one. Now, this is a Latin percussion shaker. It is also a cube. Notice I used all cubes for this. Uh, this, if you cannot see this, this is the, what I, what's pictured up here on the screen. It is a cube that looks like a die. So, you know, nice connection to our, to our Yahtzee there. So this die is knowable on the outside, so that's chance, that's testing, and it's unknowable inside. That's like all the little beans that are inside. So uh, the thing about this system is that it has, the, it has the word top on the top. Why would it have that? It's because if you hold it a certain way, it doesn't make the same sound as it does when you hold it this way. When you shake it around different ways, I have to experiment in order to understand this system. That's complexity. And it also relies on time. It's rhythm, it relies on time. Speaking of time, we're running a little bit behind, so I'm gonna zoom through the chaos engineering example, but it's a good example. Again, Derek Bailey talks about improvisation has no existence outside of its practice. So chaos engineering game days are a great way to be able to understand a system by practicing getting together to talk about chaos experiments as a team. What I'm kind of showing you as I'm talking here are some of the tenets of chaos engineering. This is a good slide to pause on for a second. These are the uh, properties of a chaos experiment. So, and these are important to read. Observability is key. You need to know your steady state. Of course you have to formulate a hypothesis. I believe this will happen, or I believe this will stay in this steady state if this happens. Define your methodology. How are you gonna do those things? We've already talked a little bit today about blast radius. That's especially important when thinking about chaos engineering experiments. And probably the most important, actually I think observability is the most important, but second to observability, is tied to observability, and that's when do you hit the big red button to stop? So we did chaos experiments at an ad tech company. What you see here are some examples of the steady state and the observability. Here's some examples of these hypotheses that you know we're going to have revenue at the same volume, we're gonna meet expectations for delivery, and we're gonna have the capacity to be able to deliver when one data center goes down and the traffic has to move to a different data center. So regional testing is what this is doing. Now how are we gonna do that? These particular data centers are controlled by DNS. So we have a tool that we need to use to be able to shift traffic around. And by the way, it's the same tool that we would use if we had an actual incident. We had an incident, oh my gosh, Colo A can't take as much traffic, it can take half, but it can't take the full volume. Okay, well let's, let's switch GNS so that we're, we've, we've flip-flopped half the traffic over to a different data center. Uh, blast radius and abort, don't do it to all data centers. We're only gonna do it to one data center, um, but do it gradually. Now, the things that we learned, uh, we verified some things, right? We verified that capacity was large enough, which is great. But you know what? Just because capacity is good doesn't mean the system is working. And we learned that the system wasn't working. But we also learned something really, really valuable, that we could save thousands of dollars on not replicating data overseas. We would have no, the system was designed this way to be fault tolerant. It was designed this way to be robust. But it doesn't matter, because, because of the way uh, ad tech works, and because of the way user targeting works, replicating that data overseas was completely unnecessary. In fact, it was wasteful. So we saved money doing it. Now, the thing that's really cool about that chaos game day is that we brought diverse people in to do it together. We did that to build group intuition so that the next time we actually have an incident, we'll be a lot better prepared. So, 
This is the last section, resilience. And like I said, resilience is a huge topic. And it has a lot of problems with it. And the problems have to do with what people think it is. So I'm going to reverse a little bit back to the music. So what do we do? What do we do when I break that string and we get to that place and we have to um, figure out what to do because we had this coordination surprise? And oh my gosh, well, we could rebound. We could stop the song. Everybody go back to the beginning. And believe me, that's not an uncommon thing. That happens a lot, a lot of the time. Some of these people who are doing performances have things that have to happen in a certain pattern. They've built this into their system so that the only way they can get back is to go back to the beginning. Well, what if we just stop real quick? Everybody stop, okay? Well, if we're a good enough, if we practice together as a team, if we've built enough intuition into our team, we can stop and start again. We can be really robust about it. Or we can apply graceful extensibility into what we're doing. So we can, and this is the way that a lot of improvising groups operate, is they run with what's going on. You know, uh, there's a great paper about cognition and jazz improv that describes the end of a song where one person, without really signaling the other person, makes a decision. And the other person, because of the intuition involved, understands, because of the jazz idiom, what that other person is doing. And so they end up coordinating in this really cool way to end the song. And that's an example of that adaptive capacity when weird stuff happens. So some people are going to recognize this quote. And I'll get to that quote in a minute. But I wanted to borrow the tone of that quote to talk about improvisational music because it goes back to the practice of practice. It goes back to the notion that Derek Bailey talks about that Improvised music isn't anything at all until it's actually being improvised. There's no, even if it's free, has no score, it doesn't exist. Even if it has a score, it doesn't exist until it actually happens. So that notion of graceful extensibility is part of those four concepts of resilience that were brought up earlier. These are actually the four. Uh, the, Rebound, robustness, and sustained adaptive capacity are interesting parts of it, but the part that really ties into the improvisational music bit is what I just described, that ability to uh, have graceful extensibility in the system. So, okay, well, what about, let's go back to the software problem. We did a game day about DNS. How is that graceful extensibility? Well, what we did is we got together and we learned things together in real time as a team. Specifically, the engineer that ran the game day, that did the methodology, let's say, let's say that that person was completely new to the team. That person now understands how to use the tool to operate the DNS failover. Now, what if that was an actual event? What if that new person who had not done that yet got called at 3 o'clock in the morning and had to deal with this problem under production pressure during an incident? He's going to have to learn how to do it then. So this, that game day, the getting together to do that practice, that is, that is an example of how we find and locate the resilience in a system and support it and be able to bolster it so that it's manageable by the entire team. So here's the quote. Resilience is not a property that a system has. Resilience is something that a system does. You may have heard resilience is a verb. It's a thing. We don't say common ground, we say common grounding. Because it's something that we're doing in time, it's something that we're doing together. And we're doing that in diverse ways with diverse people. 
There's a great talk by Temple Grandin where she talks about the world needing different kinds of minds to operate. Now, she was talking in terms of the autistic mind and that there's different kinds of minds. There's minds that work in pictures, there's minds that work in patterns, and there's minds that work in words. And because the world is such a hugely adaptive, diverse place, we have to have those, that kind of diversity in our team, teams in order to be able to maneuver and navigate our complex world. So I want to leave you with this. Diverse indeterminacy is all about that practice of practice. Diverse players on the stage in an improvisational group are there making discoveries. The diverse perspectives that we bring together in a game day or even in an incident, if you want to learn from it, they're participating in that joint activity and they're sharing common ground and they're moving their compact forward. And verse teams can manage complex systems and navigate them by illuminating the graceful extensibility that's already there. Thank you. <laughs>